first thing we have to think about is, what do we mean by a problem? When we're talking about problem solving, what is it we're talking about? So we're really talking about any time there is a start state, a goal state, and stuff we have to do to get from A to B, so stuff in the way. And you want to get a degree, well, you got to get into college, you got to pass your classes, you got to pass all the right classes, right? I was supposed to do my schedule approvals today for my advisees before noon. They'll get done, but I, they only give us like 14 hours to do the approvals, so um, I <laughs> didn't get it done in that time, but they'll get done. So one of the things I have to do is go through and make sure that my students have all the classes they need because that's part of this problem solving. So things like, here's some examples of a kind of problem you might have. You're headed to work, you discover you have a flat tire. This is a problem that has to be solved in some way. Obviously the goal state is ending up at work. How you proceed probably depends on your resources, your skill level. Some of you might know how to change a tire. If not, something you should learn how to do. I think it's something everyone should know how to do. Uh, otherwise, you might not have time to change a tire, so you jump in an Uber or you jump on the bus or take some other form of transit. Or some of you may have had this experience, log into your bank and realize you do not have enough money for rent. So to solve this problem requires either a tough conversation with the landlord, parental units, friends, holding up liquor stores, whatever it is it's going to take to get your rent paid, right? <laughs> um, picking up an odd job, and I'm not, these are all potential solutions, some of them better than others. Now, our kinds of problems start to get more difficult to solve, and we'll talk about the specific kinds of problems we're talking about, but you're single, you really want to be married with your 2.5 kids and your picket fence and his and hers SUVs, or his and his and her, hers and hers SUVs, whatever is your uh, dream life, uh, with your house in the suburbs and your 2.5 dog. How do you get to that? Don't ask me. Um, or they can be more structured problems, and that's really what we're going to talk about. So this is an example of one of the kinds of structured problems we're going to take a look at today. I'm going to introduce it now, let you think on it for just a minute, and then we'll circle back around to it later. So at exactly sunrise one morning, is this one in your book by the way? I think this one is. Um, I've tried to find a couple that you wouldn't already know the answer to if you read the chapter. So at exactly sunrise one morning, Buddhist monk sets out to climb a tall mountain. The narrow path was not more than a foot or two wide, and it wound around the mountain to a beautiful, glittering temple at the mountain peak. The monk climbed the path at varying rates of speed. He stopped many times along the way to rest, to eat the fruit that he carried with him. He reached the temple just before sunset. At the temple, he fasted and meditated for several days. Then he began his journey back along the same path, starting once again at sunrise, walking as before at variable speeds, stopping along the way. Of course, his average speed going downhill is faster uh, than his climbing speed. The task for this problem is to prove that there must be a spot along the path that the monk will pass on both trips at exactly the same time of day. I want you to think about it for like two minutes. And then we'll move on and then we're going to circle back around to it. Not so far. Well, the 
minute. We'll let that marinate for a while. So here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to first talk about the Gestalt approach to problem solving, different types of problems, methods for problem solving, factors that influence problem solving, and if we get to it, common obstacles in problem solving. So the Gestalt approach, of course, remember the Gestalt psychologist thought that cognition is transsum. That is, you put pieces together and you end up with something new, something other than just the parts. So according to the Gestalt, the gestalt psychologist, the goal here is to achieve a mental Gestalt, where you assemble the pieces of the puzzle together and you get this coherent whole and now you have a whole new insight into the problem. So we want to get this full mental understanding of the problem, pieces falling together, and we have a solution. So based on this, there are several different stages in problem solving, according to this Gestalt view. First of these is preparation. You have to be aware that there's a problem to be solved. So let's consider the problem for a bit. Then we're going to set it aside, perhaps, and let it incubate. That's what we're doing with the Buddhist monk problem. We're going to let that incubate for a little bit. Think about other things. So I'll let that hatch when it's ready. Then at some point we get illumination. That is the aha moment I've solved the problem. And then verification that our solution is indeed correct. So we're going to talk a little bit more detail about each of these individual stages in problem solving uh, and as we go through today. Probably the most important step in this um, review of problem solving is the preparation stage. Because this is really where most of the action is. So first thing we have to recognize a problem exists, attempt to understand it, and then represent and make some preliminary attempts at solving this particular whatever problem it might be. So if it's our flat tire, we're going to realize that when we walk outside or as soon as we try to go somewhere. Stand there and try to understand it. Represent the problem. Maybe you start digging through trying to find the jack and whatnot and your you know, fake spare tire that you can change. Or call AAA or call Uber, or whatever it is that you might need to do, and then come up to these preliminary attempts to solve. Incubation, according to the Gestalt psychologist, is you set aside the problem and work proceeds on it unconsciously, is the idea. Which is you know, handy if you've got the time, I guess. Um, in our flat tire example, you probably don't have time to incubate on the problem. I guess you could get to work and then figure out how to get the tire changed later. Um, but the idea is that while you're not consciously thinking of the problem, somebody somewhere in your head is tinkering around and trying to come up with a solution. There is something to incubation, but it's probably not that we are unconsciously tinkering with the problem, it's just that we come back at the problem from a new perspective and we actually return to it. Illumination then is this flash of insight, suddenly brings the solution to mind. Ah, I know, pay the rent, I'll sell my roommate stuff. That'll work. I don't recommend that, by the way. Um, but you come up with some sort of illumination that's going to provide you with the ability to pay the rent or fix the tire or whatever. Sudden flash of insight unexpectedly brings the solution to mind. The appeal of this idea of illumination is, phenomenologically, it feels oftentimes how we get to these kind of solutions, right? So any of you who like logic games or puzzles or whatnot, and once you figure it out, there's sort of this aha moment. And really, it's just that, oh, I've solved it. Really anything other than arriving at a solution. And of course, you verify. You simply confirm that your insight was correct that it is actually the solution to the problem. Nature of that, of course, will depend on the nature of the problem itself. We get this sudden flash of insight, and then we try to confirm that that was correct. 
So you're going to sell your bicycle and a couple of other things to try to pay rent. Now you have to verify that you can actually get enough money out of those things to cover the rent. Right? So this is a verification stage of that kind of problem solving. Questions about this? Relatively straightforward. A couple of things that are critical in this. One of the most important parts of this is the representation of the problem itself. We'll get more to this later, because the way a problem is represented can sometimes lead you towards the solution or away from the solution, depending on um, the way in which you represent the problem. When we start talking about logic uh, problems, this is critical. And if you're planning to take the LSAT, problem representation is a really important part of that, uh, because the way you represent the problem can actually get you uh, directly to a solution. Question of insight. Just tell psychologists that this was the key to problem solving. Others say it's just simply arriving at the solution. It's not that you achieve some insight, you just happen to solve the problem. And it's that phenomenology, that feeling of, oh, I got the solution, that they're talking about. really nothing particularly special, it's just this flash of insight. So in uh, the study by Metcalf and uh, I to that person's last name, um, they looked at these two insight problems, the triangle problem and the chain problem. We're going to take a look at the chain problem here in a little bit. They asked participants for their warmth ratings about how close they felt to a solution. So this is sort of how much time it is before they arrive at a solution. So this is an algebra problem, and then you get these sort of insight kind of problems. Uh, you can see that they start feeling like they're getting at the solution, then they arrive at the solution. So it really doesn't appear to be insight. You know, so they tested these insight, insight versus non-insight problems. Uh, but you can kind of see they're getting warmer, and then they arrive at a solution, I guess. They go quickly from uh, feeling like they're there to being there. I think the reason, for me, the reason that happens is not that it's necessarily insight, but these problems don't have individual steps. Like an algebra problem, you have to kind of go through a bunch of different steps to get to the solution. So that's where they would be in this algebra problem, is working their way through it. Whereas the insight problem is once you know the answer, you know the answer. There isn't a series of steps you take to get to the answer. You just simply arrive at it. So I'll let you make your own conclusions about that. Other questions uh, about uh, the uh, Gestalt psychologist is this idea of incubation. Um, so this is a classic study by Silviera. Um, Use the same problem that uh, Janet Metcalf did in the previous study. They have a control group that's given 30 minutes to solve the problem. They have others given a short, uh, short break or a long break in a brief period of time to prepare the problem and a long period of time to prepare the problem. So this kind of two by two um, <coughs> manipulation. Let's take a look at how to solve or what problem they were talking about. And this again was in that Metcalf problem. You are given four pieces of chain that are each three links in length. It costs two cents to open a link, three cents to close a link. All links are closed at the beginning of the problem. Their goal is to join all 12 links of the chain into a single circle, a cost of no more than 15 cents. How do you accomplish this?
how it's done. Basically, you have to say you're going to break, you have to break links and then reseal them, right? And it's five cents to accomplish each one, right? Yeah, that's the solution. You essentially break this one, this one, and this one, and then you use one to reattach these two, one to attach these two, and then the third one is used to attach the other end. Most people do, you know, spend a half their time trying to figure out, well, if I break this one and connect it, right, that's sort of where you start from. But you know that you can't get there, so you just simply have to completely break one piece apart and connect them all together. Is that exactly right? So in the control group, about half of them solved the problem after 30 minutes. The brief prep group, 50% um, solved regardless of the break time. But the group that got the longest preparation time, that is the most time to actually fiddle with the problem first, giving them some kind of break actually um, seems to provide a, a better chance at getting at the solution. So about 64% of them solved after a short break, and 85% solved after a long break. Now that doesn't mean we know that they were, we don't know if they were consciously working on it, unconsciously working on it, uh, etc. What we really think might be happening in this situation is that they come back and they just simply approach the problem from a fresh perspective. Like, I've tried all of this already. None of that's working, so let's try something new. And that's probably really more likely to be the explanation for why that long preparation time with a break resulted in a uh, higher um, solution rates. do have some newer uh, um, evidence that if you sleep on a problem, it actually does make it more likely that you'll arrive at the solution. So we've talked about the cognitive benefits of sleep previously. We certainly know that memory consolidation is occurring during sleep. But it also appears that uh, sleeping after trying to solve a problem will help you arrive at the solution. Not going to help you on the LSAT, but it might help you with other regular life problems, or if you're struggling with a stats problem or a math problem, you know, sleeping on it's not a bad idea. So if we look at this uh, Wagner et al. study, you can see uh, that those that actually slept on the problem versus those that did it early, um, before sleep or after sleep, but didn't actually sleep on the problem itself, that sleep seems to have actually uh, really benefited uh, the solving of that problem. So some conclusions. Characteristics and the way they talk about it, kind of a useful way of thinking about how problems are solved. It works sometimes. We don't think incubation is always effective, and we also don't think people always have insight. But setting aside a problem and coming back to it may be helpful. Certainly sleeping on it appears to be very effective. Particularly if you've spent some time on a problem enough time and you just haven't arrived at a solution, put it aside. I mean, you'll just be less frustrated too, so it's probably a, a good thing to do. The Gestalt psychologist has some good ideas in this, uh, for sure. We'll take a little bit more uh, advanced look at some areas in this we move along. So the next issue uh, I want to spend some time with is talking about different types of problems and why we call them these, or why we call them what they do. So the type of problem often relates to the strategies and processes we use to solve a problem. So thinking about what kind of problem you have in front of you is helpful to trying to figure out how to go about solving it. The first sort of largest distinction between problem types are well-defined versus ill-defined. Well-defined problems are those that have explicit start conditions, goal conditions, and means of proceeding. 
you're in the middle of this right now. You have a start state, graduate from high school, you have a goal state, graduate with an undergraduate degree from Georgetown, and a relatively clear means of proceeding. Not always perfectly clear, right? I know, I know there's always some confusion about what classes you have to take. But you have to reach 120 credits, you have to take this number of, of major classes, this number of minor classes, you have to take uh, this broad coverage of classes, relatively well defined. So that's a well defined problem. An ill defined problem is one with no clear start gate, start gate, start, no clear start, uh, no clear goal, and no clear means to proceed. <laughs> so these are things like, I really want to be happy. We all do. Um, there's no clear outlined way to do that. There's no clear outlined way to find a spouse, meaningful career, etc. So these are a little bit more ill-defined. And the ill-defined ones are probably the ones that really kind of haunt us the most, right? These questions about um, how to get from A to B. Right? Uh, a lot of us like to have nice, clearly defined ways of proceeding. And that's why things that don't have that can be frustrating to us, right? So those are ill-defined problems. Well, um, to help us a little further with these well-defined problems and the kinds of problems we're going to talk about really in here, we'll go through what's called Greenos typology. Greenos just simply come up with different ways of describing these kinds of problems. And we've faced these before. So the first of these are problems of arrangement. So it means you have to rearrange things to a different state. So anagrams are the simplest form of these. Anyone want to take a crack at these? Buses. This one's Mafia, which I think is the only solution to that. Object, yeah, or object, one of the two. Same spelling, either way. <laughs> Excellent. So that's anagrams. Problems of inducing structure. These are great because you see these all the time on Facebook now. Only a genius can solve these, right? <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about. They're like two apples and a banana equals 85, and <laughs> right? <laughs> Those are what we call problems of inducing structure. So this is a, just a basic Sears extrapolation. Do you still have these on like the SAT or the ACT? Yeah. I, I remember having to do them in some form of standardized testing at some point in my life. But So um, you just have to figure out what the series is. So it's actually 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So there's two series. And then 8, 6, 4, 7, 8, 2. Because this is going up, one, two, three, four, and this is going down, eight, six, four. Word analogies is another problem of inducing structure, speaking of the SAT. <coughs> Dog is to wolf as cat is to. Right? I saw your I saw you mouth the word, right? Lion, yeah. Lion, tiger, either one I think would be fine. Um, this one's a little more fun. Dog is, or sorry, dog is to lawyer. <laughs> no, there's a difference. Um, lawyer is to courtroom as gladiator is to Coliseum. Yeah. Uh, another of inducing stru structure, problem of inducing structure, are what we call analogous problems. And there's this online version of this uh, that I cannot get to run, so I'm going to see if I can make that happen, and I'll have just give it to you to play around with. So, um, we have the fortress, the first part of this. So, we have the fortress is located in the center of the country. Many roads radiate out from the fortress, and the general wants to capture the fortress with his army. The general wants to prevent mines on the roads from destroying his army and neighboring villages. As a result, the entire army could not attack the fortress on one road. However, the entire army was needed to capture the fortress. An attack by one small group would not succeed. 
General therefore divided his army into several small groups, positioned the small groups at the heads of different roads. The small groups simultaneously converged on the fortress, and this way the army captured the fortress. Now we have a tumor located in the interior of a patient's body. A doctor wants to destroy the tumor with rays. The doctor wanted to prevent the rays from destroying healthy tissue. As a result, the high-intensity rays could not be applied to the tumor along one path. However, high-intensity rays were needed to destroy the tumor, tumor so applying one low-intensity ray would not succeed. How do we solve the problem? steal the solution from the previous problem. <laughs> so we use low intensity rays along several paths and end up destroying the, tu the tumor. And in fact, that's how the gamma knife works, um, or the cyber knife. Has anyone ever seen a cyber knife? It's really super creepy looking. Like, I'm not sure I, I mean, they work really well. But I mean, there's no good for that. So anyway, we do a bunch of low intensity gamma rays and burn up your brain tumor and then you're healthy and off you can go. <coughs> so those are problems of arrangement and inducing structure. And we have problems of transformation. This usually requires a series of operations to get from an initial state to a goal state. Um, classic in this area is called the hobbits and orcs problem. Sometimes it's called the cannibals and missionaries problem. So we have three hobbits and three orcs arrive at a riverbank. They all wish to cross on the other side. Great. Fortunately, there is a boat but unfortunately the boat can only hold two creatures at one time. Also, there is another problem. Orcs are vicious creatures, and whenever there are more orcs than hobbits on one side of the river, the orcs will immediately attack the hobbits and eat them. Consequently, you should be certain that you never leave more orcs than hobbits on any riverbank. We're not going to sit here and solve this because it takes a really long time. So you guys see how it's done, right? You have to move two orcs across the river and leave only one. And now you have to take, so you've got two orcs on one side and an orc and three hobbits on the other. And then you have to <laughs> bring one orc back and take one hobbit over. <laughs> um, and so you have to kind of go back and forth uh, to get this kind of solution or problem solved. So this is a problem of transformation. Uh, the others are things like um, the Tower of Hanoi, and the acrobats problem. The Tower of Hanoi we talked about when we talked about memory, which is where they have, you have the rings, we have to move the rings from one um, peg to the next. Uh, this is the ac acrobats problem. You have to move the acrobats. You want to start, you start this way and you want to end up this way, and so the acrobats can jump onto each other's shoulders, but obviously this guy can't jump onto his shoulders. So you have to move little acrobats on top of bigger acrobats, very similar to the Tower of Hanoi. So you're basically transforming the uh, sequence of events. So this is the Tower of Hanoi, sometimes also called the Tower of London. You know, if you have nothing to do on the plane slash train ride home this weekend, you can download a Tower of London or Tower of Hanoi app on your phone and discover that it takes about a minute and a half to solve, and then you'll have that stuff in your phone forever. Um, but <laughs> it's a pretty easy thing to do. That's the Tower of uh, Hanoi. Um, let's see if I can. It wouldn't load, it wouldn't load the other day in my office. So this is basically what you do. This one here, this one here, this one here, this one over here, this one here, this one here. I haven't gotten very far down now, have I? Take you back over here. Back over here. Ta -da. Um, so that's that is the Tower of Hanoi and all its excitement. Now you can actually add more this. <laughs> you know, I if it's a long train ride and you really feel like you need to, <laughs> to try it out, this obviously takes a lot more movement. We're not going to do this all day, though. Um, I don't suggest talking to yourself while you do that on the train either. People will look at you funny. Um, 
I don't care, you know. Record yourself, maybe you can become a YouTube star. Um, or get thrown off your United Airlines flight. Whatever. Um, <laughs> sorry, I had, had to do that. Um, so, how do we solve problems? Um, well, this is where we get it, so we get back at this heuristic problem. This is one of the reasons why I've started doing decision making before problem solving, even though they're kind of out of order in the book. Algorithms are a series of rules or steps that guarantee a solution if followed correctly. Heuristics are more shortcuts or rules of thumb, like we've already talked. Um, the problem is uh, what you have the ability and time to be able to get done. So a human chess player cannot play chess algorithmically. That is, you simply do not have the time to go through every possible move to select the next move. You have to use sort of rules of thumb based on what you know about the game and your experience with the game. Most computers that can win chess only now do so because we have gotten computers that are so fast they can run through every possible move and pick the best one uh, that way. So some problems are not amenable to algorithms, so heuristics are more effective. Uh, and chess experts really have this incredible innate knowledge about the game. So for example, there's a classic study by Chase and Simon uh, where they had chess experts and novices uh, look at a game in progress versus a random arrangement of chess pieces. And the chess experts could recreate the game in progress, but not the random pieces. And the novices couldn't do either. Because the, the pieces randomly placed on the board didn't fit into their knowledge and understanding of the game, so they couldn't use their knowledge to memorize the board because it didn't fit with what they know about the game. And so uh, that's one of these things you develop an innate knowledge of. It's very different from others. So some common heuristics for problem solving include means and analysis, where we determine the difference between our current state and our goal state. You guys just did this, right? just registered for classes, and you had to look at where you are, which is where you want to be, and figure out what you needed to take to do that. Very simple. We tend to use this in transformation problems, but it's not always the best strategy. It is when you're getting your degree. But uh, in the Hobbits and Orcs problem, sometimes you have to move away from the goal of getting everyone across and get a bunch of people back on the other side. So just doing means and analysis will often actually make it harder for you to solve. One of the things you can do is establish sub-goals. So these are, of course, states that are intermediate to the goal state. How good does it feel when you finish some set of requirements on your transcript? Right? Yeah, I'm done with all those classes. Now I'm done with these classes. I'm done with my minor. Right? You've got those sub-goals established, because otherwise getting all the way for four years feels really long. So if you establish those sub-goals, it actually makes it easier to get where you're trying to go. And some of these specific problems, the most effective strategy is to reach the sub-goal of getting all three orcs across the river. And you can solve it in about 10 fewer moves. This is why we didn't sit here and do that, because I don't have time to do 30 moves of orcs and hobbits in a canoe across some strange river and, you know, whatever, you know, land we're in. But establishing sub-goals are important, and particularly the more complex the problem is, getting a sub-goal is a really, really effective way of making your way to the final goal. Um, any of you sort of longer distance runners? Anybody here? You make a sub-goal, like I'm going to make it to the end of the key bridge, and then I'm <laughs> before I collapse and die, <laughs> which is probably about twice as far as I could run. Um, <coughs> we establish these kind of sub-goals. So you might have a goal of wanting to bench press, bench press twice your weight. You're going to set the first sub-goal as bench pressing your current weight. Uh, all of these are effective ways to getting at a longer-term goal. Another common heuristic is solution by analogy. We just did that. So that radiation fortress problem. 
uh, is the simple, we take the solution from another problem and apply it to this problem. So the la next area I want to talk about are different factors that influence problem solving. Obviously, the strategy used is one of those. The way in which you represent the problem is also um, important and can actually alter whether or not you can solve the problem. Let's start with what's called the mutilated checkerboard problem. You are given a checkerboard and 32 dominoes. Each domino covers exactly two adjacent squares in the board. Let's say 32 dominoes can cover all 64 squares. Now suppose two squares are cut off at diagonally opposite corners, like this. Is it possible to place 31 dominoes on the board so that all of the 62 remaining squares are covered? If I actually handed you 31 dominoes and a checkerboard, we'd be here all day trying to figure out whether or not you could do it, right? There's a really simple way to represent this problem. I'm going to put the checkerboard itself back up and see if that leads you to the solution. right. Each domino will cover a red square and a black square. And so you've taken away two red squares. There's no way. right? There's no way to get a domino to cover two black squares without sawing a domino in half. <laughs> Which we're assuming that was an illegal move. <laughs> but that's exactly right. That's how you represent the problem. So Kaplan and Simon discovered that it depended on how you represented it. They were least likely to solve the problem here. Um, most likely, I think, with color and a little bit less likely when it was with words, as I recall. This is all, I think, covered in the textbook. But it's all about how you represent the problem. Well, this is my old school. I like your text version a little better. But yeah, it's going to cover, each domino can cover one of these three. So excellent. Oh, this is going to cause flashbacks for some of you. Mary is 10 years younger than twice Susan's age. Five years from now, Mary will be eight years older than Susan's age at that time. How old are Mary and Susan? Well, let's we have Mary. equal to 2 times Susan minus 10. So Mary plus 5 is equal to Susan plus 8. Right? How do we solve for it? We just have to substitute, right? So if x equals 2y minus 10, now we have 2y minus 10 equals y plus 5 plus 8, right? Or sorry, plus 5. So 2y minus 5 equals y plus 13. Susan is 18. Did I do all that right? <laughs> Anyone checking my math while I did that? Basically, you do sim symbol substitution, right? So you have to take the words and turn them into symbols. It's, you know, your basic algebra problem. Ah, this is your favorite. The matrices problem. Psychiatry problem. 
me another eraser here. This is very, very much like what you will get on the LSAT, those of you who might be prepping for the LSAT. Biggest trick to these kinds of solutions is coming up with a way to represent them. So we have Karen. Laura and Mary. And then we have Norman, Omar, and Peter. All of whom are have the last names of Ruben, Sanchez, and Taylor. By setting up this matrix, we can start figuring out people's names. So Karen is the psychiatrist for one Dr. Rubin, so she's not Dr. Rubin. Laura is the psychiatrist for the other Dr. Rubin, so Mary is Dr. Rubin. Laura seems to have all these things. Laura is the patient of Dr. Sanchez, which means she's Laura Taylor, which means that Karen is Dr. Sanchez. Peter is the patient for the other. Peter has his psychotherapy with Omar. So let's see, so that means Omar is Dr. Taylor. I don't know what happened to Norm, but I lost him in there somewhere. Um, <laughs> anyway, you get the idea. You can quickly start identifying who's who by doing this kind of problem representation. Most of the LSAT kind of problems involve this kind of solution. Uh, the ones that, which I, from the uh, last student I talked to who was taking the LSAT, they used to do these awful ones where <laughs> there was a round conference table and you had to find a seat for everyone and this person had to sit next to that person but this person couldn't sit next to this person. And they you do something like this. So basically, this kind of problem is essentially the same as a Sudoku problem. It's logic. You're trying to infer. You have to figure out which things fit where and which ones don't fit where. So this kind of mental practice is essentially what you're doing when you're practicing for problem solving. Okay. So the Buddhist monk problem. I think I have another top hat activity. If not, we're going to do one anyway. Nope, I didn't have it. the Buddhist monk problem to remind you Buddhist walking up the mountain spends a couple days walks back down the mountain, leaves at the same time both days, proves that there must be a way in which the um, monk will pass at the exact same time in the exact same place on both days you log into Top Hat, take a stab at an answer. What's that? Is it open? <laughs> Sorry, I'm not, I didn't look at your answers. It sounds like there's a good one. I mean, I have no idea it's a perfectly acceptable answer. That's the reason. Since I'm recording this, I hid that so that your responses don't end up on YouTube. So. I'm going to have to come back to and read them. It sounds like they're good.
know how to solve the problem? Who hasn't looked forward in the PowerPoint? <laughs> well, this is all about problem representation. And in this case, we can do it this way. So, 8 in the morning, you know, sometime in the evening, just say. We can graph out our monk's progress. The monk leaves and he wanders along and he walks his way up and then eventually he makes it to the top. So that's day one. Day two, he walks down, gets there faster. These lines have to cross at some point. So there has to be a point that he's at the same spot on the trail at the same time of day. Even if he parachutes down the mountain. <laughs> He's still going to cross some point at some time uh, at the exact same time, right? Now I say that all cocky, like I'm, you know, Alex, Tre Alex Trebek, and I figured this all out on my own. I just know these answers that Papa took it along. It doesn't matter how you graph it out; these two lines have to cross at some point. <laughs> it's basically the same logic as a stop clock is right twice a day, right? <laughs> Basically, because they're leaving at the same time and traveling on the same path, or he's traveling at the same path, it'll be the same time in the same spot. So other factors that influence problem solving are characteristics of the information processing system. So your working memory capacity, your ability to retrieve problems that you've solved like this before are both important. Working memory capacity is very important in problem solving, which be fairly straightforward as the more information you can work with, the more pieces you can work with, the greater your ability to take it apart and put it back together again. Why is long-term memory so important? Well, if you've solved a problem like this in the past, then you can apply that solution now. That's why practicing for things like the LSAT is so important. And practice as many of those things as you can because there's only so many ways they can ask questions. And at some point, you'll hopefully have already done a problem of the type that they're asking you and so that's a really important part of prepping for these kinds of problem-solving type exams. So individuals with greater working, mes working memory capacity have higher fluid intelligence. Here's a big problem. High-pressure situations can reduce working memory performance. So you might have worse problem-solving in those high-pressure situations. Remember, when we talked about working memory and stress. Stress hormones zap working memory capacity, and as a result, you have reduced working memory capacity. So calmly, <laughs> this is so much easier said than done, approaching something like the LSAT, you have to take, because you're going to go in a little, like, you know, edgy anyway, and you have to convert that from stress into motivation, right? Like, you know, it has to be, you have to try to take that and make it positive, because you're going to be a little jazzed anyway. Two people yacked in the middle of my LSAT, so that was really pleasant. <laughs> like, like, I thought, well, you're probably not going to make it through law school anyway, so it's probably best you should go home. Because um, if you're puking in the LSAT, what's going to happen during the bar, right? Or your first day of law school. Um, so, that's something to keep in mind. Sometimes the uh, other things are things like the task environment. Um, so how's the problem represented? So thinking about like the reverse acrobat problem, that makes it even harder. Um, the mutilated, che mutilated checkerboard problem, how is the problem represented? And then of course our prior knowledge, which is back to long-term memory retrieval. Do we have knowledge about this? Can we transfer it to this problem and use that knowledge to solve this particular problem? Right. <laughs> I have a tendency to live on the on a fiscal cliff most of I have for most of my life, and my friends are never uh, are constantly amazed at my ability to pull money out of thin air. Um, so that's something I've been able to do quite a bit. Um, usually, it's because I, I 
can pick up extra work all of a sudden. All right. Um, last thing to talk about are some common hindrances to problem solving. The first of these is mental set. If I wanted to torture you, I could have you do this whole problem, but we're going to summarize it. <laughs> um, in Luchin's water, pro water jug problem, basically, you have these three different container sizes that you can use, we'll call them jug A, jug B, and jug C, to create the desired quantity. Right? So to get to 100 liters, let's just say, it's going to be hard to lift, but um, we can take jug B, you know, pour out an A, and now we've got 106, and we pour out a couple of C's, and we end up with 100. So then we go to this next one, 163, well, if we pour out two C's, that gets us at 100 and, uh, what, 13, then we subtract out an A, and we end up with 99. Well, it turns out you can keep solving these using that B minus um, A minus 2C. <coughs> but then you get down to the bottom here, and people then have a tendency to do the same thing. It's like, oh, well, if I take B and subtract A out, I end up with 30. Um, 29 minus 28 is 31, right? And then minus 2C, yeah, so we get a 25. Of course, all you can really just do A minus C. It's much that much simpler. So people get in a mental set. They get into solving the problem in the same way. It's a problem with expertise. So it's this bias or tendency to solve problems in one particular way. Um, as you start moving out into careers, you're going to get this mental set well, we've always done it that way. Anyone run into this yet? It's the worst kind of mental set there is. Well, we've always done it that way, so we should just do it that way from now on. Um, you've all done this too. How many times will you restart your computer before giving up and deciding it needs fixed? About four or five, right? It's usually <laughs> like, or your Wi-Fi, your Wi-Fi router too. Or like those of you who have routers at home, they have Wi-Fi routers in their actual houses. How many times will you unplug it and plug it back in before you give up and decide that there's something wrong with the cable, <laughs> right? <laughs> that is a classic mental set. It happens to me all the time. Um, that's because Comcast sucks, and they're always working on it in my neighborhood. And so it's always, I'll be like, and I'm, I sometimes I'm up, especially on the weekend, I'll be up late, later than I probably should be watching a movie, and I'll be like, what happened? <laughs> like, I'm right in the middle of this movie. Can't you do this during the day when no one's home? Um, anyway. Last couple things to wrap up are functional fixedness. This is a classic. But people don't fall as prey to this any, prey to this as much anymore. Just use things differently. So the task here is to create a candle holder. So you want to hang the candle on the wall using what you have there. ideas? Yeah. 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 That's it. The box is there to use for you to hang. People think it's there to light the candle. Like when I first tried to solve this in my cognitive class, I was like, well, you melt the candle and then once it's melty, you stick it on the wall, <laughs> which would work, by the way. I'm still convinced. Um, but the basic idea is you think the matches are there to light the candle, but you can actually use the box, right? Martha Stewart's taught us a lot about how to take, you know, eight tin cans and a Kleenex box and turn it into a centerpiece. Um, I love Martha. I especially love Martha after she got out of jail. She's much better. She's much more relaxed. Has anyone ever watched, has anyone watched the Snoop Dogg Martha Stewart potluck? If you have not watched it, it is the best show ever. Um, <laughs> It's seriously the best show ever. <laughs> um, so this is a two-string problem. Obviously, this is a very recent um, piece of art we have here. Um, so the idea is you have to somehow get these two strings tied together. A 
let's assume, arguendo, that this table will not support him in his fancy game. All right, I have to next show you my absolute most favorite <laughs> graphic ever. Oh. Wait, it gets better. <laughs> why it cracks me up. I think it's the snotty smile on her face at the end. <laughs> it's so bad. Uh, anyway, that just tickles me every time I watch it. So basically, <laughs> you're supposed to take one of the objects on the table and use it as, uh, to swing the other thing back and forth. So functional fitness, fixedness is this tendency <laughs> to use an object in its customary or usual way. And so we get stuck on it's only it's only for that use, right? We have a lot of less of that. And I think I think modern TV has done a lot of that because we look at things differently and we can use them in different ways. Uh, certainly, there are probably some personality correlates that go along with this idea of functional fixedness. Right. Questions? We are done just a scotch early. Um, so we will pick up on something next week. I think it's gender and cognition or... Oh, I think we have logic and reasoning still to do. That'll be fun. All right, I will see you all next week. Have a great break.